wanted to kind of put in context, and I just love the last speaker, thank you so much for that, um, about why we ended up doing what we ended doing, which is taking a town that looked like this, when we started eight years ago, into a town that looks a bit more like this, which is in the north of England, it's got marginal land, it rains a lot, a lot, um, but now it's got veg and herbs and fruit and all the rest of it in very public places in the middle of the town. And they're there for a reason, they're called propaganda gardens and they're there to start a conversation. This is a town of 15,000 people, it just happens to be the place I live in, which is why that is where it started. And the reason it started was that some little eight years ago, nine years ago now, um, I heard a lecture by Tim Lang, who was telling us about the state of the planet, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, I've been a local government leader and what have you for a long time. So I've done lots of stuff where I've been throwing loads of money at loads of communities and made bugger, bugger all impact, as far as I can see. And 22 years ago or whatever, we were all there. We got excited about the Rio Summit, didn't we? We all thought, thank God they've got the message. It's going to be all right. And 22 years later... We ain't getting very far with all that, and everybody's finding every excuse in the world why we shouldn't do things differently. So I come from a part of the world that invented cooperative thinking. I, Rochdale Pioneers, nine, nine miles down the road from where I live. If they could do it, we could do it. So the one bit of the equation that was missing in all this, it's not clever people. We've got clever people, loads of clever people. We've had clever people since time immemorial. We've got political leaders, we've had them since time immemorial, and they're not taking us very far. We've had all sorts of people who could have done something different, but the bit of the equation that we've not got it's enough people who stand up and say, this isn't good enough for my children, and I want to do something differently where I live, in the place. Now, I don't have any major solutions to some of the big problems that you'll be considering today. I've just got an experiment that's been going on for eight years in a town of 15,000 people in Tobedon that uses the language as food as the motivational factor to get people thinking, just maybe, I can't do anything personally about the level of the sea at this moment, or that polar bear over there, or whatever, but maybe I can bring a kinder world into my community. Maybe I can just do something through my own actions as a volunteer, not waiting for a check, not waiting for permission, not waiting for another flapping policy or strategy document, but getting on with doing something myself. And that's my little bit of this equation. That's it. It's just a bit, but it has to be a part of a mix because at the moment it's sadly not visible. So, on a train back from London in two hours with no consultation whatsoever, I made up the incredible edible model. And it was because I have lived, you know, around for a long time and seen and heard what motivates politicians and leaders to make decisions. And it's not all about academia, I've got to tell you. They hear all these great things and they say, well, that's marvellous, but what's going to be popular? What are people going to vote for? You know, I mean, sometimes you get a leader. Thank God. You know, sometimes I was around when good old David Miliband became uh, Secretary of State for the Environment. The very first speech he ever made was on climate change. I thought, oh, thank God we're going to get somewhere. And then he went to the Foreign Office and that was the end of that. <laughs> so, this is a really simple model based around the place that you live. And at the time, I was only thinking about Tobinan. If you put local food at the heart of community and create edible landscapes, will it make a difference to how people are brought up and think about their space their environment, their relationships. I don't know. It's an experiment. Let's see. If you put local food at the heart of learning, what we share, what we know, what we've forgotten, what our schools might teach or should teach, would that make a difference? And if you put local food at the heart of business, so you start to think of the power of the pound in your pocket, influencing local economies, that means to say local apprenticeships and getting you jobs for your kids and whatever, just those small actions, if you put all those three together, it's the jigsaw of your life, could you make a difference to where you live? And if you could make a difference, could you stand up and challenge some of the perceptions and the frameworks created by the people who don't think there's need for change? Creating edible landscapes. Okay, so you do it all over the place. You have to create edible landscapes, preferably without asking people's permission, but if you have to, you have to. Uh, but in places where people can stop and talk and like them or hate them or engage with complete strangers and remembering when they used to eat whatever it is that's growing. So this is the first one we ever did. It was a dog toilet. It's a verge on the side of a road that goes to Burnley. It wasn't loved by anybody. It was obviously public realm, but nobody was looking after it. Fag packets, 
you know, litter all over the place. So obviously you never ask people's permission to do anything about that. You put your rubber gloves on, off you go, and you tidy it all up. You plant up herbs, edibles, you know, whatever you've got in your back garden or your bottom drawer, or whatever it might be. Because you don't need money to do all this stuff. We are a nation of chasing money. Can we stop doing that? So you plant them up all over the place and you end up with that. And the interesting thing about that is within 18 months, the council started mowing the grass and put a bench in there so that people could enjoy it. It's quite interesting how simple things around engaging people with food allow people to do something that I wanted to do in the first place. That's a local government officer whom I adore, but who didn't feel he had the power to do it in the first place. But the second place, he felt he could because the community had given him a thumbs up. The next thing is a private space. This is Mary, my mate's front garden. It's on the road up to one of our estates. One of the greatest partners we've got are social landlords. They're totally fantastic. They're totally on board. They're taking the incredible ethos to all parts of the UK. This was a normal garden, petunias and roses and what have you. So we took up the front of it. We took the wall down so people could climb into it because all propaganda gardeners are food for sharing. This isn't only about I'm right clever at growing rhubarb. This is about how can we actually remember reconnecting as communities. Lots of different things. Single point of focus. Maximum elaboration. You go over the wall. You, you, you help yourself to whatever. We've got a sign up there made free by a local sign maker. This is what's in season. This is what it looks like when it's ready. If it looks like this, don't bother picking it. It's going to be horrible. You know, the very, very basics about working with communities that have forgotten how to do things. This is not a movement for people who read the Guardian in particular. This is a movement for people who just don't know what to do in their lives because the telly isn't take, doing anything about it and the local MP isn't doing anything about it. So they can think they might as well have another drink in the pub. I generalise about that, but now I have a lot of drinks in the pub. But this is a movement. If you eat... You're in. That's the motto of Incredible Edible Tobin. And there's all sorts of fantastic spin-offs around that. The one I do have to tell you, and I always say it because it's true, is the first people to get in here was a, wo a woman and her two kids who were walking to a primary school. Um, two years normally before people will go into a public garden and pick because they think they're going to be sued or shot or whatever it might be. So they climb in there and they pick it and they go off home with whatever veg they've got. They come back with the outer leaves of the cabbage or kale or whatever it was, put it in that bin because the school had taught them how to do that. Fantastic. But importantly, the next morning on Mary's doorstep was a bowl of soup made from the vegetables and herbs picked from a garden by complete strangers. You know you're on something when people start to behave like that. Then the health centre. Now this is a no-brainer. They build a new health centre, we did ask for permission, we take up all the non-edibles, we plant all the edibles ourselves, we fundraise it ourselves. Instead of doing £5 million pounds or whatever it is, eat five a day campaigns, why don't we just always make health centres edible? It's the simplest way to get people to reconnect with the food around them. And all sorts of interesting things happen as a result of that. Job centre. They asked us, would we make an edible job centre? Well, why wouldn't you do that? Because people have lost the job, they've no bloody money, and they have to walk across that every slipping week. That's a bit depressing. So we plant this up with an idea that you might want to think about reskilling, using your own private space, or whatever else it might be. It's just an idea. And then, of course, because we've got a sense of humour, we asked the police would they mind if we use this forecourt at the front of the police station on Burnley Road. We built some raised beds, we got the wood from a competition that we won from B&Q, and we planted sweet corn. It's not indigenous at Tolbadon, but it made us laugh. And the really interesting thing about that is the police's own statistics, and they bring police from all over the country to see this, and it's only a raised bed, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> the police's own statistics say that environmental damage in the town is down because of the propaganda gardens and community relations with the police are up. Now, it's just interesting. All we're doing is planting veg and herbs, but it has created a shift. The local authority has designated all public land that's not strategic for community growing. We've got the health centre who is now adopting our way of doing it as social prescribing. There's all sorts of spin-offs that people can bring to this simple, simple model. Learning, how you get little boys to poke out people's eyes by understanding <laughs> the importance of living soils, the year of soil, and we ought to have more conversations about that. My schools aren't talking about it, I don't know about yours. We've got public growing in the middle of our town where we're showing kids this is on a, uh, a stretch called Pollination Street. We made up that name. It doesn't actually exist. But we took over that space and we planted up things so that people could hear, uh, smell and start to taste different types of herbs from different types of cultures. We've taught people about grafting because if you want to create orchards all over the place and you know money, you ought to learn how to do it cheaply. We're teaching kids about aquaponics. We're teaching them about hydroponics. We're trying to work in schools with family groups. We're racking up on high streets, showing them what to do with the stuff. None of this is clever. It's just a little bit joined up. Those are people who are doing bits of stuff, 
But in my view, we need to join up all together. And then you end up with things like food cooperatives like this and baker's cooperatives and women on the estate making a bit of extra money on the side, and that's fantastic. This was the BTEC that we actually did with the high school. We have no success with high schools in the UK, personally speaking, from an incredible edible point of view. But this was one that actually allowed us to do a BTEC in agriculture for kids that had never had a qualification before. So at least it was starting them on a road of believing in themselves. Because this is a movement about growing people, not growing vegetables. So, the last bit, you've got edible landscapes, you're learning new skills all the time. What about creating local jobs and sticking money? When you're in a volunteer group with no paid people whatsoever, what are you going to do? Well, we bought some blackboards, we gave them to various market traders who were selling these locally anyway. They scratched up whatever they were doing, it started the conversation, their sales went up. That created more traders who wanted to actually work on our outside. Some people bought some land, some people turned their existing land into a small holding. Whatever it was, it stimulated an interest in local food and top of them, and it is next door to Hebden Bridge. Nobody had heard about it whatsoever, and now it's feeling quite cocky about itself. And Hebden Bridge is so yesterday. <laughs> anyway, people are actually coming here to taste food. Why? Because every single cafe and every single restaurant and every single shop that sells food is selling local food, stimulating the local economy. Very small grassroots, but nevertheless starting to grow. This is Carl, cheese man. He's now a prize winning cheese maker. You can see what's happening all over the place. Porkers, SJ, Breeze New Pace, fantastic stuff about making local chorizo and whatever it might be. We didn't orchestrate that. The market will meet you if they start to believe what you're actually doing. If there's demand for local food, it will follow. And these are just a quick and dirty that was done by Sheffield University. Oh no, it was Leonardo project that he came over. That is not the most robust piece of evidence you've ever seen in your entire life, but it's an indication of a line of travel. And we would love to work with more people who wanted to help us evaluate what we're doing in a way that wasn't counting beans. So I absolutely love what you were saying. But the most important thing we've probably done for the economy is create vegetable tourism. And people do come from all over the world to poke around in raised beds in the centre of our town when there's quite often nothing in them. We created a green route so that people could enjoy the experience of walking past from our train station all our propaganda beds, but also taking the footfall through the local market so they can buy local food, past the local shops and the local cafes so they don't come to the supermarket and back. We're really big in China and Korea and God knows what, but we don't know what they're saying about us, but we think they like us because we keep coming back. We created an edible canal towpath. We've never asked anybody's permission to that. It really is boring going with the authorities because they look at you and the first thing they say is, how am I going to evaluate? Forget that. Just at the moment, let's just crack on with doing something and then we'll see if there's anything that's worth evaluating. So we've got a towpath that we're making edible. There's all sorts of things, fruit and apricots and peaches and herbs and you name it. We've got lovely bird, bee and bat boxes that a local artist made along the route. Local traders are getting in the swing of this route and are putting uh, food to share outside their uh, businesses. And right in the heart of town, this is the pollination street that I told you. It was a hoarding right next to our market at the start of the depression. What are you going to do in a town that's trying to keep alive? So we persuaded the local authority to take it down. We said we'd take over this corner of it. We planted up all sorts of wonderful uh, fruits and herbs and so on. We put a false beehive there. We renamed it Pollination Street with a sign that nobody stopped us putting there. We've got a woman now that comes along and puts Japanese poetry. The local authority took the rest of the sign down and they put picnic benches in a wildflower orchard. It's really quite interesting how people want to behave positively if you get them small things that are achievable. And as a result of all that, from a town that wasn't actually doing anything whatsoever about its future, they're buying into neighbourhood planning. This may not be any big deal for people in this room, but in Tomlinen, they did nothing but whinge and feel like a victim. This is a big step forward. And now they're imagining, if food was the driver of this town, where would we put it? What would we demand about spaces around our houses? Where would the industrial units be? How would we want our market to function? What do we want about pedestrianisation? And all that type of stuff. And we created a couple of social enterprises as well. I don't suggest that anybody gets any money to do any capital stuff because it's a living nightmare. But I chair one of them, which is the Incredible Aqua Garden, trying to teach young people and families about aquaponics, hydroponics, and urban farming in the future. Because if we are going to have to produce a heck of a lot more food locally, who's investing in those urban farmers? And the at the bottom here, the Incredible Farm does a lot more outdoor work. It employs local people, it's got apprenticeships. It, we're just testing the market, we've only been going eight years, but it kind of feels like we might have created a little bit of a turn for the local economy. Last thing, is it just a load of nutty people in Tottenham, or Totnes, or Lewis, or wherever else it might be? Well, no, actually, it's not. 
We've created an incredible edible network. We've been supported by locality to do that. We've got peer stuff in there. We've got toolkits for learning or business or community or how to start or how to expand or how to find somebody that likes you or whatever it might be. And we've got 106 communities tapped into that all over the UK. Some of them quite considerable. Salford, Brighton, uh, Totnes isn't bad. Um, I'm trying to see some of the others. Newport is pretty good. Doing some interesting stuff in terms of size. Some really small. Some just six people trying to work out how to spin those plates. Propaganda guardians, buying local or whatever. Telling the story. And the key to all this is not about the people themselves, but how do we as society respond to that? And some people write books about us, and some people put stories in newspapers about us, and some people have offered to do all manner of wonderful things to promote a very, very simple idea. And this is at the heart of everything we do. It's not about being right clever. It's not about bringing a load of technology. It's not about spending a load of money. It's belief in the simplicity of the power of small actions. Because in my view, from what I've seen, it can change the future.